Leia here from LeiaForSci.com and in this video we're going to look at the birch reduction reaction and mechanism starting with benzene and then we'll see how the products differ for substituted benzene when we have an electron donating or electron withdrawing group as the substituent. Birch reduction is an interesting mechanism because benzene is aromatic. It's very stable due to conjugation and this reaction would breaking that conjugation. We're starting with benzene, but we're ending with a non-aromatic, non-conjugated cyclohexadiene. Normally we don't show the hydrogen atoms on benzene, but I'm showing them here so that you can recognize what's going on. The two carbons that are reduced are opposite to each other, and they start out as sp2 hybridized resonating carbon atoms. They gain an extra hydrogen and become sp3 hybridized, no longer capable of resonance. We recognize that it's reduction because we have a gain of hydrogen atoms shown in purple. This reaction is similar to the alkyne reduction that you've seen with a metal that donates electrons through a radical intermediate. And the key here is the sodium atom. Sodium in its ground state has one valence electron. Electrons like to be paired and when they're unpaired as radicals, they're very, very reactive. Now sometimes you'll even see it written as a complex where you have sodium with some number of ammonia and a positive charge together with a free electron, the electron that came off sodium because sodium prefers to have that complete shell by giving away that electron. This is what makes it so reactive. Let's take a look at the mechanism for birch reduction. We start out with a sodium atom unhappy with its lone electron, donating that electron to the benzene carbon. We show a fish hook or a half-headed arrow because it's a radical. It's only one electron moving over. But the carbon that's receiving that electron already has a full octet, four bonds, eight electrons. And to add that electron, it would be a total of nine electrons and an over full octet. So what we have to do is kick out the pi bond. You get the one pi bond kicked out and the second pi bond also kicked up putting the two groups as far away from each other as possible. We'll show the radical in green, the red electrons as a pi bond shifted over one position, and the black electrons as a lone pair sitting exactly opposite to that radical. And don't forget this pi bond hasn't moved. Before we continue, let's take a look at what happened over here and why specifically the electrons wound up where they are. The incoming radical puts an electron on the lower carbon, and we already established that we have to kick out these electrons. These electrons can initially collapse onto one of the two carbons that holds that pi bond, the one that's further away from the radical, so that each one now has a complete octet even though they're not very stable. We have a radical on the lower carbon atom, a lone pair on the carbon next to it with a negative charge, and the two other pi bonds haven't moved. The problem here is that the electrons are too close to each other. Electrons are like charges, they tend to repel each other, and the goal is to push them as far away as possible within that molecule. And since we have resonance capability, it's possible to move it further away. So we'll take these red electrons and resonate them up towards the upper bond, forming a pi bond between these two carbons. But this carbon will have too many electrons in its octet, so we take the electrons that are already sitting there and collapse them onto the upper carbon atom. The radical hasn't moved, so it sits on the bottom. The red electrons form the pi bond. The black electrons form a lone pair with a negative charge, and the purple pi bond is still on the other side. Put brackets to show that they're resonance structures, and recognize that the radical and the lone pair are as far away from each other as possible. While it's not an ideal or stable molecule, this is as stable as it can get when we have these three electrons just floating around the molecule. But it's not very stable. These negative electrons are very reactive. They're looking to get rid of that negative charge. This is why we have a polar protic solvent in solution. Ethanol is a two carbon alcohol with a partially negative oxygen and a partially positive hydrogen. That means it can act as an acid and the lone electrons on this carbon will act as a base. The electrons will reach out for the hydrogen atom, breaking the bond between hydrogen and oxygen and collapsing those electrons onto the oxygen atom. This is the first reduction 
because we now have an sp3 hybridized carbon atom with two bonds to carbon and two bonds to hydrogen, but we still have a radical in the molecule, and that means it's still unstable. Before we show what happens to that, let's take a look at ethanol. Ethanol is now deprotonated. That means it forms an ethoxide. Ethoxide is ETO minus. But don't forget, we have a sodium in solution with a positive charge. Na plus and ETO minus are in solution, charges are balanced, and we have sodium ethoxide. But we still have a radical, and we have more sodium in solution. A second sodium atom in solution will donate its electron to the carbon that already has a radical, and this gives us another negative electron pair on carbon, where the first electron came from the first sodium, and the second electron came from the second sodium. Once again, the negative carbon is a base and it's looking for an acid to react. Which acid will we use? Another ethanol in solution. The lone electrons will reach out for the hydrogen, give oxygen back its electrons, and that's our second reduction. And this gives us our final product, which is the double substituted, one for this carbon and one for the carbon exactly opposite, it's non-conjugated because we can no longer resonate cyclohexadiene. But now what happens if we're starting with a substituted benzene? How do we know which specific pi bonds to break? When you're starting with just benzene, it doesn't matter where you start your reaction because every single carbon on benzene is the same. When you have a substituent, you have to pay attention to how the substituent will impact the overall reaction. Let's look at the product first and then understand why we get it that way. If you have an electron withdrawing group, then the carbon that gets reduced is the carbon attached to the electron withdrawing group and the carbon opposite that electron withdrawing group in the para position. When you have an electron donating group, you get the exact opposite. You get a shift over. So the carbon that has so the carbon that is attached to the electron donating group is not reduced, but the carbon next to it will be reduced. That would be here. And then the carbon para to that is the second one that's reduced because they have to be opposite each other. The mechanism is the same. It's really a question of understanding what happens with the intermediates to help us understand what happens with the products. But first, an electron withdrawing group, remember, is a group that pulls electron density out of the ring this can be something that'll resonate or something that just has a positive or partial positive charge. So let's put positive or partial positive. An example would be a carbonyl, where you have a C double bound O and the C is partially positive. An electron donating group is something that will donate electron density into the ring. This could be something with a negative charge or something that is partially negative. Keeping this in mind, let's review the shortcut for the mechanism. We start out with a benzene ring, and we attack at this carbon. We chose a carbon at random, that's where we attack. That means the carbon where we attack with a radical will ultimately be reduced to give me two hydrogen atoms. The carbon exactly opposite, para to that, will also be reduced, getting another two hydrogen atoms. And then the pi bonds will be on the remaining carbons in the ring. But here's the important question. What intermediate did you have before you got that second hydrogen atom? That intermediate was a lone pair of electrons and a negative charge. A lone pair of electrons and a negative charge. Let's look at an example using anisole. Anisole has an OCH3 where the oxygen has two lone pairs of partially negative electrons. They're capable of resonating into the ring and that makes it an electron donating group. If we were to react this molecule from the top and bottom, we would get a lone pair of electrons at the bottom with a negative charge and a lone pair of electrons at the top with a negative charge. Now, given the partial negative on oxygen, do you really want to have a negative charge directly near that electron donating group? Absolutely not. So what you want to do instead is shift the position of attack one over. It doesn't matter if it goes to the right or the left. If we shift the attack over to the left and get a negative charge slightly away from that electronegative oxygen, it'll be a slower reaction, but a lot more favorable than putting that negative charge right there. 
And if that's the negative charge, that's the carbon we reduce. Exactly opposite is this carbon, which also gets a negative charge and also the carbon we reduce. And that gives us the product we predicted where the carbon holding the electron donating group is not reduced, but the carbon next to it can get reduced and the carbon opposite the reduced carbon also gets reduced. That was the logic. The shortcut is to simply look at the starting molecule and ask yourself, can I place a negative charge on the carbon holding the substituent? If yes, reduce that carbon. If not, reduce the carbon next to it. And whenever you reduce the first carbon, always reduce the carbon opposite that, opposite right there. The next example we'll look at is benzaldehyde which is an aldehyde attached to benzene ring with resonance between the carbon and oxygen giving me a partially positive carbon and partially positive oxygen. The partially positive carbon attached to benzene makes this an electron withdrawing group because the positive charge tries to pull electron density out of the ring. Let's use that same shortcut. If we reduce the carbon holding the substituent, we would have a lone pair negative charge intermediate and we would have another one opposite. Can we have a negative charge on the carbon that is directly next to a partially positive substituent? Absolutely. Opposite charges will attract each other, they'll stabilize each other, and that means this is an ideal position to react. So if that's where we have the negative, that's where we put the extra hydrogen atom. So we redraw the product with the aldehyde in place, we add an extra hydrogen atom to that position. That means it's a reduced carbon. Also reduce the carbon exactly opposite, so we'll put the hydrogen atoms on that carbon, and the remaining carbons will get your pi bond, giving you the predicted pattern for the electron withdrawing group. The trick, once again, is to look at the carbon holding the substituent, ask yourself if that carbon can hold a negative charge, and if so, reduce that carbon and reduce the carbon exactly opposite. Be sure to join me in the next video where we look at the oxidation of alcohols to aldehydes, ketones, and carboxylic acids. You can find that video along with this entire series, the Oxidation Reduction Practice Quiz and Cheat Sheet, by visiting my website, layerforsci.com slash redox.